So we're continuing our series today, um, uh, learning to live in grace, uh, to walk in grace, to um, understand grace for ourselves and understand how to give grace to others. Uh, to understand, you know, we know the word maybe, but how, what, what's the Bible really teach about? Today, uh, the last two or three weeks I've talked about it more in um, a conceptual idea, what you understand God forgives you. Today I'm going to get a little more theological. I'm trying to not get too deep in the weeds with it, but a little more like why, why is grace so amazing? What does it mean when we say that we are saved by grace? What does that really mean? So the title today is Fancy Words life-changing truth. The fancy words are justification and sanctification. Those are the fancy words. So I'm going to explain those words as we kind of go through some scriptures in Romans. Um, by the way, if you have the, the, U, the U version app, Bible app on your phone, you can open that up. And if you go down to the bottom right-hand corner, it says more, the little three lines right there. If you click that and hit events, it will show you all the, all the scriptures that we'll see on the screen today will all be listed for you, uh, the outline points, all that kind of stuff. Oh, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, before I get in the out, a message, uh, I don't know about if, it, how, who this applies to exactly, but if you are a lady, if you're a lady, raise your hand. All the campuses, raise your hand. You're a lady, right? Okay. Um, you guys are lucky I can't sing. How my brain works. I make a comment. I'm going to make an announcement for ladies. Ladies raise their hand. And all of a sudden, I he hear Steven Tyler in my head. Does anybody know that? You know what I'm talking about? If I could sing, I would have. Anyway, I decided to put I didn't. So, uh, <laughs> some of those go, like, what song is he talking about? Well, you're, you're too young. Um, <laughs> so, um, we. Not this Tuesday, a week from Tuesday, uh, here at our Carnival campus, uh, we'll begin a, a class called Holy Yoga. So ladies, if you're interested in yoga, uh, we'd love to have you come to it. Uh, information will be coming in the newsletter, got mailed this week, so you'll be getting a newsletter about it. We'll be in the news, the emails are coming out this week. Uh, if you don't get emails, you'll get newsletters. You probably ought to let us know that you're here today and give us that information, right? So Holy Yoga is going to start up. Uh, Tuesday, 5.30s is when it'll be at. So, um, all right, so let me jump in the outline. No, before I do that. Um, I'm going to give you two definitions before I read Scripture to you. Justification. Justification, and there's, these are written in your outline, so you don't have to write them down if you, don't, uh, if you have the outline with you. Justification is when God declares a guilty sinner righteous based on the finished work of Jesus at a cross. That's justification. So the, in the Bible, I'll read some of the day. I'll say we are justified by faith. So I'll explain all that in a few minutes, but that's what the word justified or justification means, that, that God has declared a guilty sinner righteous. Then there's the word sanctification, which I won't talk about as much, and it's not really in the passage as much, but it's, it's, the word's not used at all, but it's there. The word sanctification is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in a believing sinner's life to make them righteous. Now, you hear me talk about that a lot when I use the, the Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 7 passage, about how the Holy Spirit's wringing out the, the, the unrighteousness of our life and he's sanding paper off rough edges. That's that, that's that term for sanctification. It's an ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. So those are the two big words I'm going to try to explain today. And we're going to jump into Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore... Since we have been justified through faith, justified, that's that word, right? The word justification, that means God has declared us innocent by the finished work of Jesus at the cross. That's what the word means, right? Because we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith and to his grace in which we now stand. Now, sometimes we read stuff and we go, I don't know what that means exactly. Well, what it means is we're saved by our faith in Jesus. We're saved by his grace to us. That we're justified, that we have been declared uh, innocent 
by his grace, by our faith in him. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. It goes on, verse 3. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame or does not let us down, does not fail us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Now that, that terminology there in verse 5, that's, that's the same terminology that's used in t- the Titus passage I quote all the time. That the God has poured his Holy Spirit out upon us. Verse 6, you see, at just the right time, when we were still, still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone uh, die for a righteous person, but for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What it really means is, because we're all sinners, right? It means that while we're guilty in our sin, while we were separated from God because of our sin. Verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And that's an exclamation point. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this but we shall also boast in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. All right. So let me explain all that. Let me start with the, uh, number one in the outline. Biblical Christianity defines the process of salvation as being justified by faith and absolutely not due to our works. Biblical Christianity defines the process of salvation as being justified by faith and absolutely not due to our works. The concept of justified by faith is what separates biblical Christianity from every other religion, every other belief system, including some branches of Christianity. Just because it's Christianity doesn't mean it's biblical Christianity. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, this concept, this one concept right here. This is, this, justification is a fancy word, okay? We usually use that in a negative sense. Well, you're just trying to justify yourself. It means I can do what I want to do because I have a reason to do it, right? That's what that means. And we usually use it in a negative sense. This is being used in a positive sense. It's that God hung his son on a cross, made him become a sin, And because of that one sacrifice, he justified us. He pronounced us innocent if we place our faith in Jesus. Biblical Christianity teaches that we are justified by faith and faith alone. So like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. We are saved by grace, through faith, not of our works. You can't get much simpler than that. You know what I mean? You don't have to know the Greek to understand that. You don't have to have a theological degree to understand that. It's pretty simple. That we are saved by God's grace when we place our faith in him. And our faith is not, again, it's not believing in your head. It's believing in your heart. It's when we believe in our heart, this is Romans again, where it says that when we believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you confess that, uh, if you believe that Jesus Christ raised on the cross and you confess that he is Lord with your mouth, then this is then you are saved. And this justification thing happens. It, it happens instantaneously. The moment you place your faith in Christ, you're saved. Now, that doesn't mean you don't want to go to hell. Not wanting to go to hell doesn't save you. Wanting to see grandma in heaven someday doesn't save you. You're saved by God's grace. And when you place your faith in him. The moment that takes place, 
you're saved. The moment that takes place, his spirit indwells you. The moment that takes place, you are justified. Though you are just as guilty as you were the moment before, you have been pronounced innocent by God because of the finished work of the cross. Because he made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin. Let me read you a couple other verses and explain that. Let's go to chapter 3, Romans chapter 3. I'll pick up verse uh, 19. Now we know... That whatever the law says, it, it says to those who are under the law. So that every, uh, every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. I mean, again, very clear, right? No one will declare, be declared righteous. Justification by faith means declared righteous. God has declared you righteous. What? No one will be declared righteous by the law. It goes on. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. I think I may have mentioned this a little bit last week. Um, if, if there were no, there were no signs on the sides of roads that had a thing called speed limits on them, right? Some of you would still drive like grandma, right? And some of you grandmas, like, I don't know how many of you guys at the Carmel campus know uh, Carol Polo, but she's at the Staunton campus. She's got a lead foot, that girl does. Okay. I'm filtering out stories. Anyway, some of us, no matter what our age was, would drive a little fast. How many of you really work at driving exactly on the speed limit? Let me see your hands. Come on. How many of you, nah, I'm kind of a slow driver. I kind of putz a little bit. How many of you kind of have a little bit of a lead foot, especially if certain songs are on? <laughs> right? Right? I mean, I just, right? We have things, right? There's no speed limit. I don't know what speed limit is. It's road straight. I'm just going to go fast. Right? It's a good road. I mean, if there's a chuck hose, I'll slow down, but there's not. We're going. Well, they put a sign up, and the sign is for safety. And the sign says, you know, because whether there's a school or there's kids or, you know, you're in the open interstate, there's reasons they have a sign up, and the sign has a number on it, and that number becomes a speed limit. And therefore, you may, all of you lawbreakers, unlike myself, who never would do such a thing as that, right? Uh, all you bad people. I, have, I just I can't believe you sin so often like that. But when you drive down the road and you're driving 60 and a 55 or whatever, right? That's five miles over. That's not a big deal because that's how we justify it, right? Mr. Police Officer won't pull me over if I'm just a little bit over, right? So 65, you drive 68 or 70. You know how, you know how it goes, right? You're justifying. That's okay. But there's a sign on the road that says you sinned, quote, quote. You, you're breaking the speed limit. It's 55 miles an hour, you're driving 70, and you're as safe as you can be. But if Mr. Police Officer pulls you over, you get a ticket. Why? Mr. Police Officer says, there's a sign on the side of the road. And if you've got a vehicle like mine, it even says it in my car what the speed limit is. Right? I have no excuse. I stand before Mr. Police Officer without excuse. Right? How do you know that you sinned? Or how do you know, Tim, that you broke the law? Well, there's a sign on the side of the road that said, and then my car says, but I went ahead and did it anyway. What this is saying is, is there's this thing called the law. And because of the law, you know you sinned. Well, how, who decided lying is wrong? Well, when God said, thou shalt not lie, that made lying wrong. You see what I'm saying? So if the lying police officer pulls you over the road and says, hey, we caught you lying, well, there's not a sign on the side of the road, but there's a thing called the law. And that's what it's really saying is that there's this thing called the law. And I'll get in this as we keep going through the theme because one of the concepts is, is between religion and a relationship with Jesus and this concept of being justified by faith versus um, earning salvation, being working, working our way or being saved by our works, is that like some of us are really good at rule keeping. And we like to be able to say, I, and by the way, do not raise your hand for this. Do not look at anybody. 
Okay? Some of you, when I asked you, how many of you really work hard at driving the speed limit? You're really pretty proud of yourself. And then when all those hands went up a while ago, because we are a bunch of dirty sinners around here. When all those hands went up about those people who speed and have a really hard time, especially with the right songs on, holding her down below the speed limit, there was just a little bit of judgmentalism, wasn't there? And you people are the reason my insurance rates are high. <laughs> right? Right? Okay, now, so you know that's right, right? Now, just put that in the same context what we're talking about. We're sinners, we're speeders. God's law is how we know we sin. God's law is how we know that all of us are sinners and fall short of the purpose, the glory, the mark that God has set for us. And sin's not always bad things. Sometimes sin is things like apathy. And the Bible even says that when you know a good thing you should do and you don't do it, it's called sin. Right? So don't think about sin always being bad as in by our definition of the word, but sin is what separates us from God. And God in his grace had to send Jesus to die on a cross. He's the one who pays the penalty. That's justification. It goes on. Verse 21. Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known uh, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. There's that terminology again, how we're saved. Back to what our faith is, who you believe. It's not believing your head. That, the Greek word there is not believing your head, it's believing your heart. To all who believe. Uh, there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Back in that, when he, who he's talking to, that was a big conversation. Is there a difference between Jews and Gentiles? Between those who are circumcised and those who aren't circumcised, things like that, right? Because those were part of, that was all part of the law. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. Verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith. That God's the one who did that. That God presented. He delivered Jesus. It was God's plan all along. That Jesus become a one-time sacrifice. An atonement. To pay the price to pay the penalty of all of our sin. It goes on. Let me pick up verse 26. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time as to be just and to be the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. We are justified by faith. Now, let me back up a second, talk about grace. Grace is this unmerited favor from God. Here's the difference in grace and mercy. Grace is when God gives us something we don't deserve. Salvation, Jesus, forgiveness of sin, justifies us, those kind of things. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. Okay? We don't deserve the good thing. God gives it. We, don't, we, don't, we do deserve the bad thing. God doesn't give it. Okay, that's mercy. That's the difference in grace and mercy. Here's what works does. And this is a game that sometimes it's, 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 a, it's a, you may say, no, I am saved by grace through faith. You may know we're justified by our faith in Jesus. You may know all that stuff to be true. Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. You get that. You understand that. But there's this thing inside of us that though I would say we're, we're saved by God's unmerited favor, grace, there's this thing that we all want to earn God's love. It's like this, we want to earn it. We want to be better. We want to, it's like in our brains somehow, we want to merit God's grace. Rather than just recognize it's, it's unmerited. You can't get it. And this is a hard concept. It, and here's the difference. I, I, I don't want to spend forever on this concept, but I want you to understand this. 
There's a place where if you're not careful, we begin, a, you, a person, I, begin to believe that we deserve salvation. We're good people, they're bad people. We're smart, they're stupid, whatever. We like these people, we don't like those people. And we're grace. Jacob, I just saw you, brother. Welcome. I haven't seen you forever. Sorry. There's this place where we, we know the facts, but we stop thinking that we are the one in need of a Savior that took God's grace to save us just like it takes God's grace to save the person who is, quote, really, 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 really far away from him. That it's still grace. It's just grace. That whether it's a pound of grace or five pounds of grace, every how you measure grace, right? I don't know if grace is measured in ounces, pounds. I don't know how they measure grace. But whether you're the person who feels like you need a whole lot of grace or you're the person who slides in and doesn't need very much grace at all, it's still grace. There is not a single person who will get to heaven based on their merit, based on their ability to earn salvation, based on their ability to earn God's love. You may be better people than me, but you need God's grace just as bad as I do. That on every given day, you and I are in need of a savior. We're in need of a rescue. So if you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Christ, You've never come to a place where you recognize your need for a savior. And I would talk to you about Jesus and about this guy who loved you so much that died on a cross for you so he could rescue you. But if you say, Tim, I've been saved for 40 years and I don't ever do anything wrong, I am really good. I'm still going to look at you and talk to you about a guy who died on a cross for your sin who loves you and who wants to rescue you. Because every single day, we are sinners in need of a Savior. That the difference between justification and sanctification isn't we stop being sinners. Sanctification, to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be made holy, all these kind of words, right? The word holy doesn't mean perfect, like God's holy, God's perfect. It means set apart. That's what the word means. It, it means that it's an ongoing process. The difference between being saved and not being saved, before justification, before I placed my faith in Jesus and received his grace and had been declared by him as innocent, while I stand in my guilt, is before Christ, I don't get to go to heaven. His spirit doesn't indwell me to empower me to live my day. But when by faith I choose to place my faith in Jesus, believe in my heart, not my head, then the Bible says I am saved. Positionally, what is then taking place, the transaction is taking place, is God is applying what took place, the finished work of Christ, on a cross. And saying, because Tim has placed his faith in that atoning sacrifice, Tim has now been declared innocent. He's been acquitted of all of his sin, of all of his crime. Now I'm saved. God's spirit lives in me. And he's going to keep doing the ongoing work of sanctification, which I'll get to in a few minutes. That never ends. 
one of the things that people come across sometimes is, well, and you'll hear this, and I don't know what kind of church denomination you were raised in, whatever. But earlier I said that the thing that separates biblical Christianity from all the other things, right, is being justified by faith. Being saved by faith alone, not of your works. Lots of churches teach that works are involved in the work of salvation, the process of salvation. That's not biblical. Churches of different flavors, churches, Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Lutheran churches, Catholic churches, Presbyterian churches, whatever, name a church, right? Not just, it's not like a denomination versus non, it's not like that, right? Any biblical teacher, regardless of what church background they come out of, who teaches you that salvation is saved by God's grace through your faith plus something else is wrong. It's not biblical. You're not saved because you get baptized. You're not saved because you prayed a prayer. You're not saved because you gave all your money to the poor. You're not saved because you have a perfect church attendance. You're not saved because of what the thing. That's not what it is. We are saved by grace through faith. We are justified, declared righteous by our faith in the finished work of Jesus alone. Number two in the outline, justification does not make us righteous, but rather it pronounces us righteous because of God's grace and our faith. Justification does not make us righteous, but it pronounces us righteous. Now, I've been talking about that already a little bit, but... Some groups will teach you that you can lose your salvation. That's a phrase. And other groups say, once saved, always saved. Okay? <clears throat> Both can be wrong. Both can be wrong. All right? So let me explain that real fast. Um, so, okay. <clears throat> once saved, always saved. What they're saying is... He said, if you place your faith in Jesus, you're saved. That whatever you've entrusted to him, he keeps it, all that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. That you didn't do the work of salvation, God did the work of salvation, you're saved. Period. Okay. The mistake they make is they think sometimes, well, they go to church, they got baptized, they're the pastor of a church. Surely they're saved. And that's not salvation. We can look saved. We can be all cleaned up and do nice things and say nice things and be nice people and be the pastor of a church and be lost. Like not know Christ our Savior. Have, we have all the head knowledge, but we don't, we've never placed our faith in Jesus with our heart, with the center of our being. Okay? So it's not that that person loses salvation. That person never was saved. That, that, wasn't, that didn't happen. I mean, I don't know if I told you the story. I probably have, but I was a, a young guy. I'm doing a, I was in, I, my youth ministry was growing and doing crazy stuff, you know, and so I got some opportunities to teach and do some things in bigger circles. And, and so I'm like 22, I don't know, 23, I'm a kid. I don't know, I don't know squat, right? And I'm in this room of people who are all adults. They were all old, you know, 30-year-olds. They're all going to die tomorrow, all you know. I'm thinking, what the heck? These people are falling off. Oh, gee whiz, man. Anyway, I'm in this room. And, you know, they're not hip. They ain't cool. They ain't nothing, right? And I'm thinking, man, I don't know. And I, I'm now a little intimidated because they're like adults. You know, I got moms in there. And, you know, like, I'm like, holy smoke, I don't know about this. And, and so I just start talking about whatever I'm talking about. And I go through this process. And I'm trying to explain to people, how do you explain to teenagers about salvation? And so I start explaining to adults how you explain salvation. And I'll never forget, I can't remember her name. You know, she's sitting right there, you know, my, she's in my two o'clock, right? And go through this process, and then I play this song for whatever reason, and I notice she's got tears in her eyes. And I, you know, you never know, whatever. We get done, and she interrupts me like she wants to say something. And I'm like, I, again, I don't know. She's an adult. I'm a kid. I don't know. Whatever. Yes, ma'am. Whatever you want to say. Go ahead. And she says, I've been in church my whole life. Blah, blah, blah. She named all the things she'd done. Her whole pedigree of never missing church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all the things, you know. Been teaching vacation Bible school this long and children's church this long. I've done all these kind of things and blah, blah, blah. And I'm a secretary at my church. And I've done all these kind of things. And she goes, tonight was the first time 
did I realize that if I die, I spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Now, I had no idea what to do with that. So I treated her like anybody else, and we, we talked about salvation and Jesus and made sure she understood that, and we worked that process. I was just, like, blown away. Like, why? How does a person go to church their whole life and miss that? Well, that was the first time it happened to me. But I can tell you it's happened to me countless times since. I've seen pastors saved. I've seen staff members saved. I've seen deacons, church leadership people saved. I've seen people give their life to Christ because they, they knew they believed in their head. They could pass all the tests, but they never came to a place where they placed their faith in Jesus. That somehow they thought their salvation was based on their merit, not Jesus' finished work on a cross. They never understood grace. I'm not surprised anymore. I talk to people who raised in church have no idea about the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. How do you know you're saved? Because you recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. I talk to people who think it's about their behavior. So what happens is, is if you think it's about behavior, if you think about your good works, and then a person behaves badly, well, they got saved at 12, and then they behave badly later, right? They make bad choices. They, quote, die in their sin, which means that then you go to hell. You lose your salvation because of your sin. And if you've been, I mean, some of you are probably raising churches like that, Okay. That's not biblical either. If you're saved, you don't lose your salvation. If that kid, that adult, places their faith in Christ, they're saved. That's why I'm talking about both these on the same day. You're saved by your faith in Jesus. You're justified by faith, by faith alone. You're saved by God's grace end of conversation I'll get to it in a minute maybe the like work of sanctification comes later right you're saved by faith it was real the 5 year old the 15 year old the 45 year old it doesn't matter they place their faith in Jesus it's real the work of sanctification may not take place I know I haven't explained it yet, but I mean, I am get to it. We'll see. The work of sanctification may not have taken place yet, but they're saved. They die every how long later. They haven't been in church in 30 years. Does church intend to save you? This means no. Does church intend to save you? No. Giving you all your money to the poor save you? No. Does being a pastor of a church save you? No. How are you saved? You're saved because your faith in a God who loved you enough to send your son, his son to die on the cross for you, and you placed your faith in him and received his grace. You're not saved of your works. If you've been taught you're saved of your works, that's not biblical. It's wrong. Now, just because you got baptized doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you go to church makes you saved, et cetera, right? So when somebody dies, when somebody lives, how do you know they're saved, Tim? Well, the only way I know they're saved is by the activity of the Holy Spirit in their life. Do we recognize the activity of the Holy Spirit in their life? That's all I got. That's all that person has. So just because someone went to church to make them saved, just because someone didn't go to church or someone got, went to church and got burnt and got out of church, just because someone didn't match your standard of good works doesn't mean they're not saved. 
one of the things that happens sometimes is, well, what about, what's this whole thing about dying in your sin? Well, okay, so they'll always talk about suicide because, you know, like it's, it's murder, self-murder, right? And if you die, and some churches teach this, if you kill yourself, therefore you clearly go to hell. That's not biblical. That means you can unsave yourself. What if you die in your apathy? Apathy is sin, right? What if you die with your bad attitude? What if you die with your judgmental heart? I mean, you know what I'm saying? There's all kinds of sin. Well, yeah, but if I'm apathetic, I have a chance to repent. Okay, you die immediately of a heart attack. You didn't have a chance to repent. Are you going to hell because you was apathetic? Are you going to hell because you fell into some addiction or you fell into some mental illness or you fell into some pain? That's not in the Bible somewhere. You're not saved because of your good works and you don't lose your salvation because of your good works. It doesn't work that way. That is not biblical grace. What does a person need to be saved? Uh, They need to place their faith in Jesus as their Savior. That's it. That's all? I'm I'm clearly not going to get done with this, but like in the end of, jump with me fast back to chapter 5. Chapter 5, going into chapter 6. I'll pick up verse 18, chapter 5, verse 18. I'll go into verse 6, chapter 2, verse 2. Consequently, as one trespass resulted in the condemnation of all people, Eve, Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the, in the garden. Okay, that's, the, that's what they're talking about. Okay. So righteousness, so one righteous act resulted in the justification and life for all people. Jesus being the one-time atoning sacrifice for the sin of all mankind. That offset what happened at the garden. Okay. For just as though the, the, the disobedience of one man and many made, were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that we would tr- that trespass might increase. In words, the more speed limit signs there are or the more roads you can speed on, right? You would know that you're breaking the law more times because there's more signs. So the more laws there are is the more you know that you're trespassing, you're sinning. But where sin increased... Grace increased all the more. In other words, the more you sin, I mean, I'm, again, I'm making stuff this part up because I, I don't know how they do that. But if, if it takes one pound of grace to save you, okay, and then you clean up really good, you're good. Okay, great. But it took one pound of grace to save me, and I just keep needing grace. Like we're up to like 70,000 pounds of grace or whatever, right? But what it says is the more that you sin, is the more the grace increases. You just keep getting more grace. That you don't run out of grace. What that means is you don't lose your salvation. It, what it means is, is that Jesus finished the work at the cross. That he became sin. Tim's sin. Your sin. He became sin. He hung on a cross. He was a one-time sacrifice. That when he died and all the sin of mankind was upon him, God said, by that one sacrifice, I will justify others. I will declare them innocent if they place their faith in me. So when you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, raised from the dead, then the Bible says you're saved. You are justified by your faith. Okay, his grace is there already. That happened at a cross. He judged sin. He atoned for sin. He paid the price for sin. He paid the price to redeem us from sin on the cross. We're saved. Is in like the process of salvation. Grace, it's all there. So it says we're saved by faith. What it means is the process of justification of salvation, it's already there. But it doesn't get applied until we choose by faith to believe. That's the place where, well, I'll get to in a second. So that, that sin reigned in death. So that grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All that's just saying, it doesn't matter what happens after salvation. You're saved. If you really were saved. If you really place your faith in Jesus, you're saved. 
if you really were justified by the blood of the cross, all that other kind of stuff, you're saved. End of conversation. You're saved by God's grace and faith alone. End of conversation. No more debates about it. It's over. Okay. And then it goes on. Well, what shall you say then? Shall we keep on sin that grace may increase? I mean, that's what it sounds like, right? <laughs> by no means, verse 2. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live any longer in it? Now, I'll get back into this next week. But here's the deal. What that's saying is, is it's beginning the process of sanctification. That if you're saved, the Spirit of God indwells you. He lives inside of you. It doesn't say anything about being perfect. It doesn't say anything about going through windows of time where you fail, where you're broken. It just says, says that if you place your faith in Jesus, it just says that you're saved. So here's the question I got for you. Are you saved? Are you confident that you have a personal relationship with Jesus because you have placed your faith, not your head, your heart? That you believed in your heart that He raised from the dead and He's Lord. What I'm going to say doesn't make you not saved. It just means that you misunderstand it. Or are you still trying to work it out somehow? Like sometimes I'll say to people, so if you die today, would you spend eternity separate from God in a place called hell? Or would you spend eternity in heaven And the answer is always like, I hope so. That if we're honest, that many of us are hoping so. I'm hoping that I'm saved. I'm hoping I've done enough good works to get there. I'm hoping that a loving God doesn't send people like me to hell. I'm hoping that Today would be a good day to get past hoping. It's not good works anymore. And I'll get into the rest of it next week. It's not good works. It's, I'm not saved because how good I am. I'm not going to get unsaved because how bad I am. I choose as an act of my faith to believe in Jesus Christ or as an act of my will to believe in Jesus Christ, to place my faith in him as my Savior. And for every one of us, we are declared, hear that? Declared innocent, acquitted of all charges. That everything that stands against you was hung on a cross and forgiven by the work of Jesus on the cross. If you've been unsure of your salvation, that doesn't make you unsaved. If you're confident of your salvation, that doesn't really make you saved. Maybe you was raised to believe something different. Maybe you was raised to believe that you did a good enough good things, you get to go to heaven, and I'm kind of blowing your mind today, and you got to process for a while. God understands that. I'm not going to try to talk you into something. Some of you may be like, this is freedom. I didn't understand this. Like, I know I'm saved, and I'm, I know that, but I, got, I, I live in this little legalistic cage because I, I'm not good enough. I'm never good enough. And that handicap is, I can't do what, I'm never good enough. I can't serve here, I'm never good enough. I can't volunteer, I, I'm never good enough. I can't invite, I'm never good enough. We have this, I'm never good enough. 
That's why God, you know, God doesn't answer my prayers. I'm not good enough. I could never do it. I'm not good enough. <laughs> when God declared you righteous the moment you placed your faith in him. He doesn't make you righteous. This means he declared you righteous. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in us that does the work of salvation that goes from I was saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in us that's washing and cleansing us from unrighteousness. That's ringing out, you know, the paint roller illustrations, ringing out the unrighteousness in our lives that's sandpapering off the rough edges. So maybe I know I'm saved, Tim, but I've been ignoring that work of the Holy Spirit in my life. See, you were saved the moment you believed. That's all it's required, your faith. That's it. And what happens with some people is we just don't continue the work, let this Holy Spirit continue the work of salvation, continue the work of wringing out the unrighteousness and sandpaper off the rough edges. So here we are five years later, 10 years later, 30 years later, and we look like we're completely unsaved. Why? I mean, we're not saved. Our works don't unsave us. Or sometimes what happens is, is it's that, it's that kid who gets saved early, they raised in church, they get saved younger, and they haven't done anything bad. They don't really know they're a sinner. They just don't go to hell. And their salvation, their understanding of God is still at that age. They're still an eight-year-old salvation and a mental understanding of salvation. And here they are, get older, and life comes at them, and they're making decisions, and their flesh is raging full, full force, and they're making decisions. All of a sudden, they realize, I must not be saved. I wouldn't do all these things. I'll get in that next week. I don't know where you fall, but I know that wherever you fall, the, cro the cross was enough. That wherever you fall, that God's grace is enough. And I know that God knows exactly who's setting where. He knows who's listening. Some of you, what I'm talking about today, you're applying to you. Some of you, maybe you're applying to your kids or your parents. Some of you, maybe God's using it to answer some question you've, you've struggled with for a long time. At Cross Church, I'm, we do, we're pretty routine. I'm going to close in prayer. We've got four songs we're going to sing. Some of you love the saying, some of you not so much. But the reason we do it that way is so you have time to process. You have time to work through what you've just heard. What's God speaking to you? What's he saying to you? How are you going to respond to him? Let's close in prayer. Mary, Father, God, I, I am grateful that I don't have to earn salvation from you because I'd blow it. I'd blow it over and over again. God, thank you for grace. God, thank you for only requiring faith from me. God, thank you. God, as we worship, some things we talked about today may have been a little hard or heavy or new information. God, I pray that you help us apply it to our lives the way you want us to for your glory. So in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.